Hello everybody and welcome to another episode of the Disgustingly Resilient Podcast, Faction Fundamentals for the Death Guard Faction in 10th edition Warhammer 40,000. Um, today we're obviously going to be looking at a unit deep dive, so much like we did the character deep dive late last episode, we're going to be looking at the rest of the units that make up our roster. So just a quick note before we go on, um, my channel has become a partner on YouTube, we've managed to achieve that goal which is really cool, um, which means we are eligible to get stuff like members, um, you know, sponsorships etc. So if you do like what you're seeing, do consider becoming a member. It's massively helps the support on the channel. Um, any like revenue we make will go towards obviously, you know, better better microphone quality. You know, I managing to upgrade stuff. I actually don't have one monitor at the moment, so I would like a second monitor. So that would be great to make it a lot easier. <laughs> but people that are already members, thank you very much for your support. I'll give you a shout out at the end. There are benefits for it. Um, such as deciding future channel content, etc. And um, more on that at the end. Let's get into this because we're all here for the main thing, which is the unit deep dive for the Death Guard Codex. So let's uh, get going. So first up. So when we talk about unit deep dive, what are we going to actually be looking at? So much like the last episode, we're going to be looking at a unit's overview. So like we're going to give it a bit of a rating on its stats, like def defensively, mobility, offensively, like cost efficiency, all these kind of things. We're going to be talking about their role in the game, their purpose, the actual impact they're going to have in your gameplay and where you should be using them and what for. We're also going to look at some loadouts where applicable. So sort of obviously some units are more customizable than others. Plague Marines being a great example. So we're going to have some sample loadouts that I feel are probably some of the better options you can take. And I'm not just going to have one, we're going to have a multiple and talk about the uses for each loadout and where you should be using them and where you should be applying them. Now that doesn't mean that any loadout you think is working for you is wrong. It's just a few examples that I found work for me. But again, if it's working for you, as we always say, stick to it. If it's doing good for you, then stick to it. Um, we're also going to look at some sample units and combos. Obviously, certain units can be improved by the attachments of leaders or stratagems, etc. So where they're applicable, we will mention them and we'll go forward from there. So I'm just going to have a quick check where I got, yep, where I got recording. I just want to double check because I've done that before where I've recorded like 30 minutes in and then we found out it's not recording. <laughs> so things to consider. Unit types and roles. So they were talking about the unit's role in a game and its purpose. So for example, you're not going to be using a cultist unit to be dealing massive amounts of damage to an enemy because that's not its purpose within the game. Um, cultists are there for screening, etc. like that, which I'll explain if you don't know what screening is when we get to those kind of units. We're going to look at the cost effectiveness of units. It's great if a unit can absolutely table opponent, but it's no good to us if it's 5,000 points. Um, cost in relation to a unit's ability to perform and its impact in the game is massive. Um, you can have actually quite bad units, but if they're very cheap and you can get enough of them so that they just become efficient bodies, it actually makes it a good unit. So there's things to consider. Obviously strengths and weaknesses, certain units are good at certain things, bad at other things, and it's important that we understand both the aspects of a unit, both the good and the bad, so we can avoid the situations where you find them in the weakness and maximise the strengths of the unit. Obviously leader buffs are important, many characters can join many of our units and they can greatly enhance the unit strengths and abilities. Obviously allies can also have an impact, um, so we will have another episode fully about allies and talking about the cho choices that we do have, but do bear in mind some units when we talk about them are benefited greatly by the inclusion of allies. Uh, also quickly once again, all the artwork once again is from the Nurgles Mansion Discord um, and people that have directly messaged me to be included in this. So. Thank you very much for all you lot that are providing me with these amazing artwork of your painted models. It's really cool to see. So, let's start with the lowly Poxwalker. <laughs> so, Poxwalkers. Our plague zombies. So, offensively, they're not impressive. Let's be honest. They hit on fives. They do have lethal hits, which does help. But they don't really do much. Part of that, they're like strength 3, AP 0, 1 damage. It's not really... It's not setting the world on fire. Um, even cultists have better output than these fellas. Mobility, they're quite slow. They move four inches and that's about it. They can advance. Um, there's nothing to slow them down innately. Um, but they don't have any ability to actually get across the board quick. So they are, even by Death Guard standards, a slow unit. Now defensively, and again remember when we look at these, um, these graphs and the, the numbers you see, it's always in relation to the unit and the cost of the unit, sort of. So yes, defensively, they only have a five up feel no pain. But five up feel no pain on a unit with this role and this and the the 
the job that Poxwalker to do is actually a lot better than, for example, having like a five up save because AP doesn't matter. All that matters is you can roll a five up after the damage. Obviously, it's negated by stuff like damage two. They're a bit more weaker to that. But for the points they are, for five points a model, having a five up feel no pain is actually very strong. Game impact. So they're not the most impactful units in the game. They can perform multiple roles, as we'll talk about in a minute, but they're not, they're not like a key component yet, especially not in the current detachment that we have for Death Guard. I imagine there'll probably be a zombie horde focused one in the future with a Termin Assessed one, because that's what we had in 9th edition. But right now, their impact in the game is mainly limited to something like clogging up the board, taking over space, or just screening, or even holding home. So they're not unimpactful, but it's not like suddenly poxwalkers and the game's completely flipped on its head by the impact that they've made it can happen if you get like a lucky charge onto an objective but it's again to be in that position they probably saw it coming or left an opening it's not like they suddenly show up and the game flips on its head like like for example a crisis suit unit for tau can they can come down possibly pick up two units and now you've got giant threat to deal with instantly the game momentum can change poxwalkers aren't going to be doing that however for the price and for their job which again we're going to get into in a second I believe they're actually really good. 70% score for cost effectiveness. 5 up feel no pain for a 5 points per model is very strong when you're talking about a chaff, a chaff unit. Um, so yeah, personal rating, I quite like these fellas. I think they have a use. I don't think they're auto take, but I'd never feel bad to have a unit of them. So, what is the unit? What was the purpose of this unit? It's a chaff unit. For those that don't know, chaff is basically a name that is given to units that don't really serve a purpose to deal damage. They're there to just exist, get in the way, be annoying, have to be killed. Um, so, for example, if you're against World Eaters, who really want to run you down turn one, so they're going to go like, you know, move nine, advance and charge with plus two to all of that. If you don't have a chaff unit, which can be in front of your army, there's a good chance those units are going to be able to charge your juicy targets, the things they want to charge, turn one. But having something as simple as 10 poxwalkers strung out in front of your army to deny those charges, because if they charge poxwalkers, you don't care. The poxwalkers are going to die, don't get me wrong. But that's kind of their purpose. They absorb the charge, they die, and then you swing back with your unit or counter charge or shoot and destroy the unit that destroyed them. And in most instances, this will result in you trading upwards. Um, they're also pretty good at board control. Um, because they can come in units of 20, and if you spread them out, the maximum 2-inch coherency between them, you can actually take up a very large area of the board. Um, and again, it's relatively cheap. 100 points for 20 of these guys spread at maximum size can really block off lots of areas of the board. Um, lots of movement options like for, against vehicle armies can get blocked. And they can be a pain in the ass to deal with, and that's a good use for the unit. Again, they don't care if they deal damage, you don't care if they die. All you care about is them being in a place and being annoying to deal with. Um, immovable tar pit, sometimes when this unit does charge into a unit, like Termagants, for example, or, you know, even Sisters of Battle, because they're engaged in combat, if you manage to get a surround off, this unit can't be shot anymore. And this unit has the ability to, every model it kills, it can regenerate models. And if Typhus is in the squad, Typhus's attacks, because remember, this squad can be led by Typhus, his attacks and his spell to deal D6 model wounds will regenerate Poxwalkers. So you can get into situations where you've come in from reserves, and I've had it plenty of times, you've come in from reserves, you've nailed the 9-inch charge because you got lucky, you're now on an opponent's objective, you've fully surrounded something like a sister squad, and every turn you're killing two or three, they're killing one or two back, but then you're regenerating them back from your kills, and you cannot be shot, and you're just stuck in this big cloggy tar pit, which is unable to be interacted with you from your opponent, unless they have a dedicated combat unit to get in there and sweep them out. And even then, I've seen dedicated combat units come in, kill maybe 12 but not the entire unit and then typhus kills like four guys back and then you, you back up to you know you back up to 12 they swing maybe they pick a model you're up to 13 they've lost a lot of their output and then the next turn they killed like five but then you killed the entire unit you you've managed to like take out one of their big threats because of your ability to just be this big cloggy regenerating annoyance on someone's objective that had to be dealt with but they failed to deal with it so I think Poxwalkers are genuinely a pretty good unit that I wouldn't ever be unhappy to have. Um, but do be aware of stuff like Blast Weapons, especially Aggressors at the moment are very strong in the meta. Um, blast Weapons will pick up big hordes of Poxwalkers, so do be very careful. So, uses for Poxwalkers. So, for me personally, um, well, not, not for well, me personally is the second option, actually. But you can use 
these guys for screens which is quite decent so i'd recommend two units of 10 if your entire reason for them is just screening now i do feel like this job maybe could be done better by a different unit which we'll look at but do remember that when we're looking when we're about to compare them to cultists that these guys have a lot better defensive ability than cultists but when you're screening again you're not kind of relying on them to stay alive as much but two times ten pox workers screening can block out stuff like deep strike get in the way of charging melee units that want to put pressure on you it's not again 100 points for two units of 10 not a bad shout another unit another use for this unit is a full 20 man squad with typhus this is a unit i use mostly um again typhus is the spell to regenerate pox walkers you can strategic reserve the unit walk them in from a board edge to get over the horrendous movement of them and i usually would do that remember typhus moves five and the pox walkers move four so if you rapid ingress to get a charge off in your turn typhus wants to be at the front because he can move five towards the enemy instead of four which makes you have a much easier charge now this unit can also do a bit of a cheeky thing where you can come in from strat reserves within range of like one or two flamers your opponent might overwatch you kill a couple guys remove the models that are furthest away then in your shooting phase, use Typhus's spell to potentially kill a few models. And if he does, you can then place the new Poxwalkers at the front of the squad, closer than 9 inches. So you put, can, with maximum coherency, you can actually change your 9 inch charge to like a 6 inch charge with this trick. So be aware that's something you can do and it's very clever when you manage to pull it off and it ve feels very cheeky. Um, another use is a single use of 10. These are good for just holding home objective. Now there's plenty of units that can do this job however the feel no pain does give you a bit of protection against random ignore line of sight shooting like mortars or havoc launches of chaos knights so if you've got cultists doing it at the moment and they keep getting picked up by these annoying indirect maybe consider swapping the cultists and pox walkers because that feel no pain can really come in clutch especially when you roll hot on it another way to play this unit is having full f f units of 20 and having three of them going for the maximum you can take and trying to go for a horde skew list now at the moment i don't believe our rules benefit this greatly again i think this will be something that's more down the line when we talk about new detachments we might get with our codex and hopefully there'll be a sort of zombie horde one which would be very cool right now i don't see this being too strong but if your entire thing and your entire thematic of your list wants to be a horde of zombies then there's nothing wrong with taking the whole three times 20 walking towards your opponent across the board strategic reserving them whatever you want to do and just having a blast with that it's it, it's not the greatest unit competitively but in a, in a casual setting there's nothing wrong with it. if you enjoy that you take that so next up cultists so sorry just have a quick drink cultists offensively they're a little bit better than the box walkers not massive but do bear in mind you get to take all the weapons with this unit so you can have a heavy stubber a flamer and a grenade launcher in the squad which is no, it's not negligible plus all the rapid fire auto guns um, mobility wise these guys are actually quite fast they're six inch move instead of five which is the standard for death guard which is nice and they also come with a scout six inch move now we've talked a lot about the things you can do with this which we'll talk about in a second but having scout move in a slow army is actually very crucial for getting to mid board points and the other things you can do with it but having a unit just move six and can advance as an infantry model in death guard is quite nice to have um now defensively they have literally nothing going to them they have a t-shirt six up save and par that they die the second something looks at this unit it will die so just bear that in mind they either have to be hidden out of line of sight or you have to be doing a very specific purpose with them to get value out of them before they instantly die because they will die instantly now game impact they can actually have quite a lot of impacts scout moves on this unit can enable you to get onto objectives before the game starts on certain de certain deployments so if you're going first and you know it because you rolled for it and you got first you then go to scout if you can make a scout move and get within range of an objective then when the your turn actually begins after scouting becomes your command phase and the objective becomes stickied because you controlled it at the start of the command phase so it becomes stickied which then means your cultists can either pull back with a move advance to safety to save them for later turns or you can go on the aggression now when we talk about aggression with cultists we're not actually talking about them going and deal damage we're talking about using them to do certain things such as boil blight plays so boil blight is a great strategy to use with cultists 
um, Zito, who went 3-0 in an RTT recently, who watches the channel and is part of the Discord, used Boyle White plays in his game. He would get first turn, scout, move and advance if cultists aggressively to get within 3 inches of an enemy unit to use the Boyle Blight stratagem to allow his Plague, plague Burst Crawlers from turn 1 to not only have plus 1 to hit, ignores cover, and they'll also be in Contagion range of minus 1 save. So that is basically about to eat 3d6 plus 9 shots hitting on 2s at AP2 ignoring cover. That is horrendous to deal with. Um, so you can get really nice trades off these units all whilst capturing early objectives and putting pressure on the opponent. Um, now the thing is cult is being so cheap with the 80% cost effectiveness and because they're able to do abilities like that and also scout onto objectives early your opponent can't ignore them because you'll run away with a primary lead. So your opponent has to kill the scout. But if you position them well, that means they have to expose units to kill the scouts. If you can set it up so that you can trade whatever they bring out to kill your cultists, because cultists are so cheap, 90% of the time you're going to uptrade. This means the opponent has traded more points to kill your cultists than you're about to kill. So if a squad of intercessors or something like that, let's say, because even five intercessors won't guarantee kill cultists, but let's say they bring out five intercessors, and they shoot the cultists and they kill them if they get really lucky in the rolls and um, they have to hit and wound everything literally and kill them all um but then you manage to trade that back with a pop you know with your plague bus crawls etc you have traded effectively 50 points of cultists for 90 points of intercessors so you at that point are at a 40 point advantage and obviously this gets extenuated the more of a unit if they, if they use something like blade guard to kill them like a full unit of blade guard and you trade the blade guard unit you can say to your opponent, well done, you've tr killed 50 points of cultists, but you've just lost 200 points of plate guard. And again, you can just keep the value going. They're also great for alpha strike protection because some armies have the ability to turn one deep strike, um, drop pods, etc. Um, knights can teleport a knight turn one with the um, mysterious guardian. So being able to scout pre-game means that even if your opponent goes first, you can push their potential deep strikes back an extra six inches, which can be the difference between saving a plague bus crawler from getting shot from like multi melters, on and not. So having them in your list is very good just to have them as a tool unit. There's multiple applications, pre-game infection, pushing out alpha strikes, forcing bad trades for your opponent, also just taking board space early. Like they're a very versatile unit, they're a very good unit. You just have to bear in mind they will literally die the millisecond something looks at them. So. I think 2 times 10 cultists is sort of the all-purpose uses for this unit. Two of them give you enough room to play around with, to push out. Again, if you string them out, it's a lot of space they can take up. So you can get nice early screens up. You can get nice early pushback on denial. You have a chance if you draw something like cleanse and you get first turn, there's a good chance you can get to two objectives and cleanse both of them for some points. Um, Boil Blight plays are opened up because your cultists can start in two different positions. So they have a greater chance of being able to get near an opponent. Um, whereas if you have just the one unit, obviously, and you misdeploy them, the opponent could be no way near them. Um, and also, it just again, you have two units to trade with, which can also cause lots of uptrading. So I think this is the best use of cultists as an all-purpose unit. Um, now, I wouldn't ever recommend taking 20-man squads because it just goes against all the good points I said. You 20 cultists die just as quick as 10 cultists, basically. Um, again, anything looks at you will die. And they don't gain any benefit for it. Like you get more guns and technically more wounds, but it's not worth it in any case. So I wouldn't recommend it. Uh, one times ten cultists. This is good if you just want cultists to have a backfield screen or to potentially have the ability to get a turn one infection objective. Because if you do manage it, it's very powerful. But this is, hey uh, yeah, guys, I'm not really relying on these clever little boil white plays. I'm just, I just want cultists to sort of either screen out my backfield. Or stop me getting charged from a key unit if they've brought something like an anger who's going to run straight at me. Um, it's nice to have. I, I would never recommend not having at least one unit of cultists because, again, just the versatility of what they can do. And obviously, there is a 3 times 10 option for maxing out on the 10 man squads. This gives you a lot of disposable action goons that can go around and do, you know, scoring secondaries. 
again making trades you can always put one in strategic reserves which is quite nice to bring on because again they're super cheap people tend to forget you have cultists in reserves because again no one's scared of cultists it's not really on the mind so they can come in score secondaries and again at worst case it's 150 points for free units that are really good at just scoring objectives and scoring secondaries and also being able to do stuff like boil white plays so it's never bad to have um but for me personally i think two times ten is the way to go so plague marines so these are the crunchy boys these are our blur so our, our bread and butter our staple unit um, and they're not very bread and butter at the moment but they are a staple unit it's our, it's our iconic unit that's the word i'm looking for offensively plague marines compared to every other battle line in the game are actually very strong they have so many weapon options that they make especially for the points at 80 points for five compared to like intercessors who get bolt rifles from like 90 points or something like it's, it's it's not even a close competition we have we have equivalent of power fists with lethal hits in every squad plasma guns up to two in every squad blight launchers anti-infantry flamers sorry i've got a bit of a burp <laughs> um, there's plenty of output that this unit can do which keeps it really powerful even if it's a bit squishy but compared to other art like other units in the game of similar role plague marines are actually quite deadly mobility wise they're as bog standard as it gets they move five inches which in our army is average they can advance um they don't have any assault weapons though nothing too special about them defensively they're not again they're not too special they're a space room with toughness five they used to be a lot better when they had minus one damage but unfortunately don't and their ability is very lackluster um it's not even really worth mentioning um but t5 is t5 so it does give you a slight advantage against strength eight not wounded you on twos which is quite important and strength four wounded you on five so it's not negligible but it's not really anything to write home about now the game impact for this unit really depends they can they can either be a core unit to your army as we've seen and we'll talk about in the next slide or they can just be there for scoring so this one's a bit of an interesting one but i think you never you're never upset to have plague marines in your list and i think played right plague marines can have a great impact they have an amazing ability to trade upwards also become quite a bully unit against equivalent units and the obviously have a high oc you can take them in msu squads or you can make them the core of your army so i think again they're quite good and for cost wise 80 points right now for five of these guys is ludicrous they're so cheap compared to every battle line in the game they are value town i personally give these guys quite a high rating i am looking forward to actually after lgt i'm going to try and start using plague marines a lot more try and go like a mass plague marine route because i want to try it out i want to experiment with some different stuff and they're such an iconic unit and i love plague marines that's like this is what got me into the game i saw plague marines and i was like these are the old fine cast ones i saw and i was like damn those are cool i love nurgle that's so cool so they have quite a high potential they're a bully unit as well so bully units what i mean by say bully unit is they're very good at beating up units that aren't elite so they're not gonna don't get me wrong if you take a max size squad with all the buffs they can punch into terminators but they really shine bullying units that are weaker than them so again like equivalent units like intercessors infiltrator squads incursor squads um anything like that which is sort of like the similar role to what they're supposed to be which is like your battle line troop these guys can punch up massively and just batter the crap out of them because the toughness five matters in those instances because those 10 those units tend not to have high powered weapons so toughness five becomes quite powerful in that instance and again we've talked about how plague marines get an absurd amount of weaponry in their kit for what they are so they're very good at swinging and killing these units however they, they are also quite versatile which means you can put them into terminators with the right buffs even land raiders etc and take off a good chunk of wounds as long as you're using the right buffs the right leaders and the right stratagems which we'll talk about and obviously virians plague marines are the only unit that can be joined by our virians virians are all the little character four wound characters that don't have any invulns like plague I'm not going to say his name um blightbringer <laughs> tallyman foul blight spawn biology poot fire they can massively impact how good this unit performs and the role it takes onto the battlefield so i believe these are three good setups of this unit so my personal favorite is the seven man squad with three heavy plague weapons two bubotic weapons two plasma blight launcher with a biologist pooch fire in a rhino 235 points gets you all that and it's a unit that has the ability to swing up massively you have a free grenade stratagem lethal hits on a five up you can obviously pay one command point to give that lethal and sustained hits on a five up with a good mixture of weaponry in both melee and shooting 
Now this is a unit that with a good roll and using the grenade strat can potentially put almost like 14 wounds to kill in a land raider. If you get a bit lucky with the minus, and obviously with minus one save contagion, which is one of my favorite ones. But it has the ability to really punch harder than it ever has the right to. And it's because that biological putrefire really helps them out in getting that efficiency. Seven man's a nice middle point on the unit. It's not committing to a full ten man, but it packs just enough punch that the five man can lack to really make it threatening. Another option to go for is the MSU playstyle, where you don't take any characters and you're just going to go for two five mans with two plasma, three heavy play weapons, and a spewer. I recommend the spear in these squads because if you've got two in a rhino, the rhino comes like a sort of pseudo plague burst crawler with his double spitters inside because you can drive around the rhino and fire them both out the top hatch. So you have 2d6 anti infantry 2 plus AP1 ignores cover shots, which is actually quite strong and turns the rhino into quite a threat. Having two five mans with no characters attached also makes this unit fairly disposable you can send them out to use their oc to just take primary off an opponent you can just send them out to do an action on something and um, there's lots of uses for two five mans and also if the rhino does die you have two units that get out and can go potentially different ways um you can drop five guys off for an objective keep five guys in to drive on to the next objective if you're looking at using your plague marines for objective play mainly i think this is probably the best use for them now the other option is going whole hog, full sending it with your Plague Marines. 10 man squad with 3 plasma guns, 5 heavy plague weapons, 2 blight launchers, 1 bibotic weapon, a biologist pooch fire and rhino. This unit was used by Steve Trimble recently at Chariot Hammer in 6 man instances. Obviously only 3 of them could have the biologist pooch fire but he had 6 full 10 man squads all in rhinos. And against some armies, you just run them over. It was kind of funny to watch because it's just a lot of output from relatively cheap units. 160 points for the 10 man plus the Rhino 75 is, is 235 points for that. And obviously, Biology Preach Fire in the certain squads makes it more expensive. But it just gives you this block of units that, when taken on mass, if the opponent doesn't have an answer for and doesn't have mass damage to weaponry, can really just roll someone over. Now, if you're playing that kind of list, you don't want to be too tactical. Um, Stephen Trimble literally just threw his rhinos at them and said, deal with it alongside Mortarian. And the opponent could either deal with it or couldn't. And if they couldn't, they got buried in, again, this unit of surprising amount of damage. And once you start rolling the ball with Plague Marines and start deleting opponents' ability to inflict damage back, they can really take over the game. Because when your opponent's fighting with scraps left, toughness 5 becomes a lot more important. Um, so yeah, I believe these are the best free loadouts to use right now. Again, it's not the only viable ones. If someone's working for you, feel free to use that. But hopefully here are three strong examples of how to use this unit. Blightlord Terminators. Blightlords, I think, have a bad reputation. Um, they're offensively, they're not great, don't get me wrong. They do, however, have a good amount of AP2 attacks. They have four AP2 attacks, which is quite nice in close combat. Uh, they also have Combi Bolter, can take a multitude of weaponry. Uh, ranged weaponry which is quite nice but nothing setting the world on fire mobility wise 50% because they only have a 4 inch move which would normally drop them lower but they do come with an 8 deep strike on like a pox walker who doesn't so that kind of brings them back up the ability to rapid ingress really helps them out the ability to just deep strike where needed again it just helps helps solve issues for the unit defensively they're quite good um, they're not as strong defensively as Death Shroud, however, they are cheaper than Death Shroud per model and per wound, which means technically, per, per, probably point per model, they're probably tougher than Death Shroud, even if they have less defensive ability. But they can also be taken 10 mans, which means you maximize the effects of defensive buffs you can put on them. In game impact, it really depends. This unit is a, can either be unkillable. And hold you the center of the board the entire game. Or you run into an opponent that's got tons of damage free weapon rate at high strength. That can put this unit in the ground relatively quickly. So it it depends. Um, cost effective though. They're fairly cost effective. They're very cheap for the wounds and for the saves that they have. Toughness 6, 2 up it save, 4 up invulnerable, 3 wounds each. For the price you pay for them is very good. Um, so cost effectiveness for what their job, they're pretty good. I personally think they're a bit underrated. I, I don't think they're as bad as people make out. Um, but I understand the grievances with the unit. Now, the best way to use the unit is as an anvil. 
when we talk about anvil and hammer units, an anvil is a unit that basically is going to exist in a space and its entire job is to survive, take hits, draw in the opponent. Then you'll have a, a hammer unit, which would be something that would then come and deliver the killing blow to that. So they are the anvil that the opponent breaks themselves upon. Once they're on that anvil, you bring in your hammer to smash it. Now, this means you're going to want to take these guys usually in big squads, and you're going to usually be looking at them to bully mid-board objectives. Now, they are not the most damage dealing. However, they do have a massive amount of damage one, which can be useful to have good versus hordes also again mass damage one with ap and melee is not the worst thing to have especially with lethal hits which we'll get into the next slide of how to maximize that but for the durability per point and they're fairly self-sufficient because they naturally reroll ones to wound if they're shooting the closest unit which means they're not as reliant on being near mortarian or having a character attached even though i still would recommend it it's just nice to have to sort of help them buff that efficiency even further so the ways to play a blight lord so i believe they can be taken in 10 man and five mans five man squad with a flail spewer blight launcher plague bolters is really good for as we said before bullying it's a bully unit you drop this in versus stuff that can't really deal with its defensive profile in five mans and you just go and try and bully that unit off a point you're not going to be there setting the world on fire with damage or killing tons of units but the idea is you go for prey that's much weaker than your unit kill it and then exist on the point with a fairly tough unit most popular however where you're going to see to play them is the anvil unit now in the anvil unit so this is a unit that wants to go into the mid board stay alive and brawl as much as possible this means you're probably going to take charges you're going to probably have a lot of units coming towards you and trying to deal with you so for this i recommend 10 man with two flails two blight launchers two spewers because again if you're existing in the center of the board a lot of things going to be moving by you or coming to engage you so having those there as an option for um overwatch is really nice and the range issues aren't as bad if the opponent's having to come to deal with you uh, plague bolters as well just stick to the normal bolt guns at this point again if you're dealing with stuff you just want to fire out lots of rounds potentially pick up some units that are skirting around the edge of you it's not massively important though now one thing that might surprise you is i actually recommend a lot of contagion in an anvil unit a lot of virulence is taken a lot because again they have a lot of shooting because they have lots of commie bolters but the problem is that isn't maximizing what the unit's good at ap01 damage commie bolters are not going to do much in the game even if you give them four rerolls to wound however what this unit does have is a lot of high ap attacks in melee Yes, it's only damage 1 and low strength, but the Lord of Contagion gives them full rerolls to hit. Now, what this means is you can fish for lethal hits. So, you can, if you come across a unit that's normally tougher than you, uh, like a tank, rather than being stuck in combat with a tank for multiple turns because we can't fall back and shoot and charge with this unit, we can instead have the Lord of Contagion there. Not only is he big and beefy himself and swings at much higher strength and damage, which makes up for their lack of damage, but allowing them to reroll all their hits in order to try and get sixes to lethal hit massively increases the capacity of this unit to deal damage especially if you've took the minus one to save contagion because then you're also swinging at ap3 potentially you can always get up to ap4 with an extra cp for ferric blight and suddenly this unit that's normally everyone says doesn't deal damage is starting to look a lot scarier and um, so i think that's the best way to use them as an anvil as a centerpiece model that's going to sit in the middle of the board take hits and brawl now the other option we have is obviously going the more shooty focused route which is going to focus on maximizing dev wounds so to do this we're going to be having two flails again i always recommend the flails just a good weapon we're going to take two reaper auto cannons because they have devastating wounds six combi weapons for all the devastating wounds and a lot of virulence to, to basically re-roll all our wound rolls in, a, in an effort to get devastating wound proccing on a four up with the combi weapons because they have nt infantry four plus and if you have anti something and dev wounds whatever, whenever you roll the anti amount it counts as six to wound which will proc the dev wounds and obviously with the reaper auto cannons them having dev wounds themselves and four shots each again but managing to reroll those wounds gives you a good chance to be able to land some sixes and just again deal some free damage now i don't think this is the best way to use the unit because they do only hit on fours with the combi weapons which is just very unreliable however if you do want to get some damage that your opponent just can't interact with then it's not a bad shout but i would i pers my personal preference from this from these three is the middle option with the anvil unit and um, but again you know season to your own taste so 
is the Death Shroud Terminators. So, Death Shroud Terminators are probably our all-star unit at the moment. Offensively, they're very powerful. Um, they have lots of anti-infantry shooting with the, with the Plague Spurt Gauntlets. Anti-infantry 4 plus to ignore cover. Um, it only got better as we got the Contagions to reduce saves, etc. Um, and obviously in close combat, they are weapon skill 2, strength 8, AP 2, damage 2. Again, potentially up to AP 4 if you use a stratagem and play minus 1 save contagion. They can swing really hard. Lethal hits and weapon skill 2 is also really nice to get the most efficiency you can out of the unit. Mobility-wise, same as Blight Lords. Has deep strike, can rapid ingress. It's not the worst. Defensively, these guys are stronger. Maybe not point for point, but they are stronger in, than Blight Lords because of their minus 1 to be wounded from attacks that are strength higher than them. But you do have to have a leader with you to enable that ability, which is one thing the Blight Lords don't rely upon. Even though I'd always recommend putting a leader in these units, the Blight Lords aren't as reliant on having a leader there. They still get their ability regardless, whereas these guys do not have an ability unless they're being led. Now, game impact-wise, these guys are, like I said, an all-star unit. They can be taking in big bricks and just be dominating a, a midpoint or, you know, basically shutting down any movement because they're overwatch. They can also be taken in free mans, which is the way I prefer to play with them, and used as almost like little surgeon tools to drop in where they're needed and impact the game where you think it's going to be most important. Cost effectiveness for 125 points, they're not the cheapest. However, they are relatively cheap for what they bring to the table, so I'm quite a fan. Personal rating of these guys, 90%. Again, they're in every list. They are the go-to Terminator, our all-star unit. And I think you'll never be wrong taking Death Shroud in any amount. Like, just at least have a unit. I'd recommend at least two units. Of three, at least, anyway. Six mans, I'm not fully sold on myself. I think they can still die. Um, but for a lot of people who it does work for, then they're very, very powerful. So... They are both a hammer and an anvil, um, because again, they're just as tough as Blight Lords, if not tougher, but they have the capacity to actually swing back and really put a dent in stuff, as well as controlling the board really strong with the Flamers. Because again, 7d6 shots, because remember your Sergeant gets 2, don't forget that. So if, if your Sergeant, he has 2, then every other guy has 1. It's a lot of anti-infantry firepower. That is horrendous. Especially if you get the minus 1 save contagion, it becomes so much more powerful. So... Again, the top the top choice is the way I use this um, unit. It's two three man units, one with a Lord of Ruins, one with a Sorcerer Lord. This makes it very versatile. You have one unit that's very good at shooting, with full rerolls to wound. Also allows them to spot. This unit's usually played more carefully with me, so it'll be there to keep the Lord of Ruins alive, spotting targets, but also controlling areas of the board for Overwatch. They can try a charge, don't get me wrong, but it's not like the main goal, whereas the other unit as the Sorcerer Lord is much more inclined to make charges and get in there because the Sorcerer Lord's giving them a free minus one damage. And do you remember, you can stack that minus one damage with the Stratagem, so if you come across damage free, like a Dreadnought as damage free weaponry or something like that, you can reduce that to damage one, which is funny as hell um, to tell someone um, I believe this is quite a nice versatile setup again you have the Lord of Ruins to spot targets and be synergistic with the units while also helping the Death Shroud unit he's within to give them real wounds to make them really nasty at Overwatch really nasty at zone control and the Sorcerer Lord helps give a bit of extra shooting punch with his once per game flat free damage and also keeping a squad much tougher than the other one it does also mean if you get multi charge on both of these units the sorcerer lord can minus one damage one squad you can use a stratagem on the other squad so now you've got two squads that are both minus one damage which is quite nice against mass damage too another way to play this unit is a full six man with tithus um with it, and you can then back that up with another three man with lord of virulence again the lord of virulence one's playing the spotter role again but the typhus is basically the anvil itself and the hammer Typhus gives the squad minus one to be hit in melee. If you take the Contagion, that gives you minus one weapon skill, minus one ballistic skill, then this squad is actually minus two to be hit in combat because hit modifiers and, ballistic, and weapon skill, ballistic skill modifiers can stack because they're not both hit modifiers. They functionally are hit modifiers, but they are, the wording is very important that it is different, is distinct. So you have this blob that if you're against a melee army, for example, having six man of this in the middle with Typhus in the squad, who also is a beat stick himself, now being minus two to hit, plus seven D6 anti infantry overwatch on anything that comes near, and the ability to put the strat on them for minus one damage, it's 
insanely powerful because you are potentially minus two to hit minus one to wound minus one damage two up four up that is incredibly hard to shift in melee and it's such a good brawling unit that i don't think there's much in the game that can out brawl this unit in close combat so again if you're more interested in just putting a big block in the middle and being like yeah come and deal with it that's probably a good choice for you another one is taking that to the extreme which is going to six mans typhus sorcerer lord basically doing the same idea of dropping them both in the middle saying yep deal with this one of them can potentially get aggressive with rapid ingress and go into the opponent's lines one of them is just going to hold the middle of the board the sorcerer lord is the same combination of being able to have minus one damage on two squads but also having nurgling supporting the sorcerer lord squad nurglings do have a six inch aura of minus one to be hit in combat which basically is going to imitate typhus's ability for the other squad so now you can have two squads that are both minus two to be hit within contagion range in melee and both are minus one damage again we're just maximizing how tough this unit can be and putting a problem in our opponent's face and saying deal with it or die and a lot of armies will not be able to deal with that so again if you really like death shroud that's another good way to go fantastic unit though fantastic Hellbrute, this is an interesting one. The Hellbrute himself is a very interesting unit. Offensively, he's okay. He's, you know, got some nice weapon options. His melee's decent. I'd always recommend a melee weapon, which we'll get on to. Um, but his offensive isn't anything to write home about. It's okay. Mobility-wise, he moves six inches. It's okay again. Defensively, he's somewhat lacking. Two-up save is nice on T9 model. However, only eight wounds is a bit risky with no invulnerable. So any really strong AP is going to basically plow through you. Always try and make sure you're getting cover with this guy because a two-up save with cover is a lot better than a two-up save without cover. Impact on the game. Now, they can be very impactful. Because of their ability to anything they hit, they choose a target that they have hit at the end of shooting and they can apply contagions to it. So... This can be minus one weapon skill, minus one ballistic skill, or minus one save, um, or minus one OC and leadership, but I don't think you can take that one much. So this is actually really powerful to be able to apply this from range, because it does mean you can potentially tag core and key units for the opponent, and then use units like Plague vs. Crawlers to do a lot of damage to that unit without having to be within nine inches of contagion range. So it gets people's safe positions and makes them not safe if you manage to tag a shot. Now because of this I like using this guy in strategic reserves because you can bring him on at odd angles, behind buildings, people don't see it coming sometimes and you shoot the plasma cannon or a sample or whatever it is you've got equipped, tag them and then your mortars can go in whilst this guy then also goes to try a 9 inch charge. Now another cool thing with this guy and I recommend always putting a melee weapon on him to give him strength 12 melee at least is his natural ability to do d3 mortal wounds after he charges can stack with tank shock to potentially do nine mortal wounds on the charge i take the fist because the fist also has a combi bolter which gives you some extra shots that have or, or a flamer which gives you some extra shots to potentially proc contagions because you, weapons like last cannons with one shot can be very risky um, again, you good chance that you just roll a 2 or a 1 and you miss, and then you've not contaminated anything. Having that backup uh, bolt gun shot can really help alleviate that problem. But the fist also makes you strength 12 in melee, which means when you charge into melee, unless the opponent is toughness 13, you're always going to get 14 dice. Because don't forget, tank shock, you get dice equal to your strength of a melee weapon, which is 12 with the fist. But you also get two bonus dice if your t strength is higher than the target's toughness. So if they're T12, they're actually minus one toughness because they're near you. So even against T12, you're going to get those two extra dice. So it's quite a high chance that this guy can deal potentially up to nine mortal wounds on the charge, which is the dream. I've yet to pull it off because, again, I'm not very good at making nine-inch charges with a Hellbrute from reserves. But you can also use them as a counter charge threat. If the, you know the opponent's playing arm, it's going to put pressure on you with melee units. Feel free to keep him on the board and not strategic reserve. And be able to just charge into those units after they've hit into something like a screen. Pop the tank shot strat, blast away 9 mortal wounds. And then pick the rest of the unit up with your damage free Hellbrute Fist. Which is very nice. So, these are a couple... Um, loadout so again you can go with the classic long range one with a last kind of missile launcher now a fun thing to do if you are worried about hitting the target with just two shots and it's more important you get the contagion on them than deal damage always remember you can fire the frag profile on the missile because you can potentially get d6 shots which has an average of three and a half so average three four 
which gives you more chances to land a hit. So if you're shooting a target, you're not really worried about the damage the missile's going to deal. Shoot a frag instead and just get D6 chances to hit the target in case you're worried your last cannon's going to whiff. Now, the one I use is the plasma cannon fist with bot plasma cannon fist with bolter, and this is the one I always play from strategy strategic reserves. Plasma cannon's got a nice range on it. It's D3 shots, which is kind of swingy, but it does have blast, which helps alleviate that. It also benefits from the Lord of Virulence spotting targets, which means it can potentially hit on twos, which makes it a lot better because again, it's a blast weapon. Don't forget, and it also gets ignore cover, which is quite funny with AP3. You also have the bolter there to help you out dealing those last little bits of. Um, you know, last shots in case you do with the plasma cannon, you can tag something with that at 24 inches with two shots, which is quite nice. Or you can, you know, just fire at something even close to you, um, you know, with four shots and potentially just, you know, again, more chances, even more chances. Then you can try a nine inch charge from strategic reserves. Even better if you can manage to rapid ingress him into a safe position so you guarantee you get the charge off next turn. Again, it's just very strong because then they've got a problem in their back lines, aka Hellbrute, which they've got to go deal with. But you're also getting the value of being able to tag a unit for your Plague Burst Crawler or anything else to then increase the damage they deal. So it's quite nice. It's, it's, it's a double whammy of a threat. And the number one, which is the most reliable way to get Contagions, is a Heavy Bolter with the Fist. Um, I know Don Houston uses this a lot. A heavy Bolter just has flat free shots. It's no messing about with this one. And obviously taking a bolt or a alongside that or a flamer, you're just maximizing the amount of bullets you can put out of it. And the heavy plague heavy bolt is honestly not a bad weapon either, but it's the easiest way to guarantee a hit because the free shots on the heavy bolt are just the flat free shots should guarantee you a hit in most mathematically. It says you should land a hit out of them. Now it's not to say you can't whiff, but then you also have the bolt as backup. But it's the it's the best and safest way to be if you just want to bring a hell brute to spread contagion, I'd recommend taking a heavy bolt on him. Fated Bloat Drone. I'm just going to take a quick strip of my drink. So, Fated Bloat Drone. Now, offensively, Fated Bloat Drones are actually quite strong. Especially given the points, the ability to take anti-infantry flamers, flesh mowers, and also a heavy blight launcher is very nice. Two of them synergize really nicely with the new contagions. One of them not so much because it's more of a long range weapon, but it's still good. Mobility wise, they're very fast for Death Guard. 10 inch move is fantastic. They do have Fly, which a lot of people say is now useless, but there is uses to it because we'll get we'll get to the bottom. But where it says shoot, charge, and action, Fly does let you go over enemy models. So what you can do potentially is charge a unit, be in combat with it, and then in your turn, if it survives and it comes back to you, or you've been charged and it's living, you can fall back over the opponent into their back lines even more because you have fly. If you didn't have fly, you won't be able to do this. Land behind them, spread your contagion to anything that's back there, spray something else, and then potentially charge back in or charge a different unit. So having fly in those instances is actually very important. Also means you can fly over units to get to stuff to actions, etc. So it's still good to have a fly keyword, and it does help mobility of this unit. Defensively for its points, it's quite tough. Three up, five up. Um, with toughness 9 and 10 wounds is quite strong. Um, it's nothing to scoff at. It can't be picked up easily, especially for an early sk skirmishing unit. It's relatively tough. Especially if you spike 5 open vulnerables on the weapons that matter. It can become very tough. Game impact. These guys can massively impact a game. They're fast. They spread contagions. They can board control with flamers. They can, again, they can be charging. They can be falling back shooting charging doing actions you can cause remember because you can shoot fall back and shoot that means you can fall back in action because you're still eligible to shoot so these guys are always active in the game there's never a point this unit is locked down and useless it's always able to do something whether that's falling back and charging falling back and shooting falling back in action it always has a place or even just falling back to a wall applying a contagion to a unit behind the wall so you can boil blight it and then shooting something else and charge it back again there's so many applications for this unit it's fantastic um, and i genuinely believe that every loadout with this unit works and for the points 100 points for this unit is it's steel it's insanity i'm running two at the moment i'm honestly considering a third one such a brilliant unit all i've heard from people that have been using them is praise and I'm really excited to get playing with these guys a bit more. So, loadout wise, they have three different roles for the weapons. So, Heavy Blight Launch is actually overlooked. You've got to remember, bear in mind, this is a fantastic flanking unit. Six shots with lethal hits at strength six, AP two, and flat two damage. 
is not terrible. It's not the greatest. However, it's 36 inch range, which is very safe, which means this guy can skirt the edges of the battlefield very safely, not draw too much attention to itself and constantly be putting shots in. Now this weapon, potentially up to AP3 if you get the minus one save contagion on a target, is actually quite scary against the space marines who generally lack invulnerables on like certain units. Because six shots, wounded marines on twos who are toughness four into freeze and contagion, at AP3 and flat two damage, you're, you're almost looking at picking up four marines a turn with it, which is very impressive. You can potentially go up to even AP4 if you really want for a command point. But for a unit that doesn't draw too much attention to itself, it's not going to blow away units, but sometimes that's an advantage because, again, if you're just chipping away one or two Marines a turn, over the game, you're going you're gonna to kill a full unit of 10, which is, for this unit, not bad, whilst also skirting around the edges, being able to charge into units and lock them up, and just be there for scoring purposes on the flanks because Death Guard don't really have units that can play flanks very well. We're very much focused on the centre, the midboard, the brawl. So having a unit that can be on the outside and still contributing is very nice. Flesh mowers, again, this is like a mid board marine killer. You can't lock it down because it can fall back and charge, so you can't even like just send chaff at it and just keep it there with like 20 termagants. No, it's going to fall back. It's going to fly over you and it's going to charge into what it wants all the time. It's very hard to stop it. Also, because it's in combat, and if you get, a, you say you're on the middle objective and you get, draw a card like deploy teleport homers, you can stay in combat. Deploy teleport homers because you're eligible to shoot in combat. Even though you don't have a gun, you are still a vehicle. So you can deploy teleport homer. And then the combat phase, because you haven't charged but you're in combat, you're still eligible to swing, which means you still get your full amount of attacks. You're dealing maximum damage whilst allowed, being allowed to do an action. So it's a fantastic unit. Very hard to stop from doing what it wants to do. And then obviously Plague Spurs, which are an amazing weapon. I love Plague Spurs. So anti infantry 2 plus is kind of broken in my opinion. It's so stupidly absurd. But this is a unit that, again, can be anywhere it needs to be at any point. It's hard. You can't lock it down. And it can lock you down now because of the board control that this gives it. 2d6 anti infantry 2 plus AP1 ignoring cover. And if you're in contagion range, that's AP2 ignoring cover. Is nuts. You can... You can fly forward, spray a unit, charge something. Then if they don't deal with it in your turn, you can fly over them or just, you know, set up somewhere, spray another unit. And then and then in your opponent's turn, be like, yeah, if you move, I'm going to flame you. <laughs> it's such a lockdown. It's such a bully unit. Again, what, what can't the bloat drone do? It's so good at the moment. So get yourself a bloat drone if you don't have one already. Get two. Get two. Maybe three. Blight Haulers, so unfortunately not as good as the Bloat Drone. However, these guys offensively are supposed to be like our tank hunters, which is yeah, negligible. Um, neg sorry, um, negotiable. I don't know the word I'm looking for. My, my brain's gone. It's been a long video. <laughs> but offensively, they're not bad. Multi Melter, again, I just wish it had the good range. Missile Launcher is okay, but not the best. Mobility wise, they're still quite fast. They do move 10, but they do lack fly. Um, so they can't be doing any of those tricks we just have a bloat drone. Defensively, they're actually a little bit better than the bloat drone, not because they are more defensive, their stats are the same, but they do have a smoke keyword, which can give them on-demand cover and minus one to be hit, which is quite nice because it also frees up Cloud of Flies to still be used on other units if needed. Now, this unit, impact-wise, it can either do everything or do nothing. Like, if you get some multi metal is so spiky and so, like... This unit will often be wounding good vehicles on fours, maybe freeze and lighter vehicles, but the heavier stuff is going to be wounding on fours. Now, if you get a lot of fours and they fail a lot of invulns, the damage you can deal is actually quite gross, but a lot of the time that's not going to happen. So they can be quite spiky in how they perform. Sometimes they feel like they do nothing, sometimes they feel like they carry the game completely. Uh, and again, if you come across a horde list, it's not a great unit to have. Multi Melter doesn't do anything there. Yeah, you've got frag missiles to fire, but it's not really going to make too much difference. One thing I will say, though, is these guys don't have negligible melee. I think it's AP1 with, like, four attacks each, which honestly is weirdly decent for a, for a, um, a vehicle, and people obviously forget that. They forget that these things have gnashing teeth, um, and sometimes you'll pick up a free unit because someone moved near it, wasn't expecting you know, or they'll charge you for example thinking oh i'll just tag these vehicles and keep them in combat and the next minute you've just like 
nom 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 like five sisters of battle which is quite funny <laughs> um, cost effective they are still quite effective again 100 points for any of our demon engines to steal for the defensive stats alone it's very good and um, so it's always good maybe not as good as a bloat drone in terms of game impact but cost effectiveness still fantastic personally i don't think they're a bad unit don't think they're a fantastic unit i think they have purposes here and there i'm not personally using them too much I'm not finding much success with them but i know a lot of people are using them and finding success so the best bits about them is the fact that they can be taken in squads so when you're in a squad that means stratagems used on them affect every model in the unit which would be all three of them in a full three man which is much more effective than having three one-man bloat drones. For example, plus one AP on this squad would affect six multi-melter shots, three missiles, and all the bio spew, um, bio spurt, which is a lot more impactful potentially than like one heavy blight launch from a bloat drone. They are one of our sources of only high AP, having AP4 on the multi metals potentially up to AP6 if you give them the extra AP and the minus one save contagion, is quite funny because it means you can blow through a land raider even if it's popped smoke and get in cover because two up save is negated by a five up, um, AP5 sorry, and then they have cover which would then it'd be negated by AP6. So it can be quite funny. It's spiky again because it's all about the wound roll. If you get that wound roll off, they can potentially do a lot of damage. But fours to wound can be so flaky. Again, helped by more time for your ones to wound. Um, but yeah, it, again, it's very, very swingy. Um, they can be surprisingly good at tarpeting because of the fact that they can melee and they're not an awful unit um, in melee and they're quite a large bases. They can actually tag stuff quite reliably and take up a lot of space on the board Which is quite nice for stopping stuff moving because they're a vehicle like knights can't go over them So there's a good chance you can you know like Charge a brigand and then stay in combat if you manage to try point it, it's even funnier because then you can't even You know you can stop the thing falling back and whatnot because again, it's a squadron vehicle um, however it's not massively as important, especially with infantry units being able to move through breachable. But if you do manage to pull it off on certain terrain layouts, it can be quite good. And at the end of the day, it's still a fast unit in a Death Guard army, which is always good to have for spreading contagions and getting around the board. Um, I think these guys can be used in all sizes of units. Units of one, again, going for more MSU playstyle, great for objective play actions. Um, it's 100 points for a 10-inch move unit model, as we just said. So there's nothing wrong with that. Can scoot around, do objectives, and occasionally pull off a multi melt shot. You never know. You might they might whiff both in bones, and you just put like what like 16 damage on something. You get really really lucky. It can happen. Units of two, I think, is sort of the balanced approach. Um, you can strat reserve these guys squad because it's not too big at this point to be really hard to bring onto the board edge. However, I wouldn't recommend doing that with a free man squad. Um, I think this is the best balance of, you know, strategy and efficiency compared to, like, investment and the ability to take up space on the board. I think units of free do work. It's obviously got the highest output, the highest strategy and efficiency, but it's a lot of space these guys can take up. Sometimes you can end up move blocking your own vehicles, um, like Plague the Scrolls with Flamers. They can really get in the way of them. But if you're really struggling for anti-tank and you really want to stay Death Guard pure, it's not the worst option to bring. Again, it's just the range issues that can be a bit pain in the ass with Molly Mellor. Plague Burst Crawler, the, uh, the value engine itself. So Plague Burst Crawlers for me personally are one of the best units we have. Offensively, they bring a lot of firepower for what they bring. Like D6 plus 3 blast mortar shots, the machine gun front 4 shots, and you've got either entropy cannons or flamers. It's not the most damaging unit in the world, however it does have a lot of weaponry on it. And when for the points it is, and the fact that it can apply these weapons from indirect, it's really hard to not get value out of these things. Mobility wise, they are again a fast moving vehicle, move 10, but they're not as fast as bloat drones in a sense. Bloat drones are at the same speed, however, these guys have a lot more issues actually getting around the board um, because they're so chunky and they don't fly. So always pay attention to your terrain. Um, defensively, two up armor save is very powerful, especially with toughness 10. Can really help you, especially if you get cover, you're effectively a one up save, which is very nice to have. Impact on the game, they're always impacting the game because indirect fire is so toxic in the game it forces your opponent to have to do something because otherwise it's literally free damage there is never a point a plague burst crawler is not impacting the game somehow you always dealing damage regardless of where you can see you can't see and it only gets better as the game goes on because then you know you can bring the flamers to bear you can bring the machine gun to bear but all the way through the game this guy is racking up value cost effectiveness they're expensive but i still think they're 100 percent worth it um personal rating for me yep 
nearly perfect, literally nearly perfect. Wish in three cannons were a little better. But as we said, forces interaction with opponent, it can be used like a surgeon's tool. You can pick out opponent's weaknesses. If they only have one anti-tank unit, martyr the shit out of it, even if it takes two turns to kill. Because once it's dead, you've got free reign of all your vehicles. Again, if they've only got one unit screen in a corner, martyr that away and then next turn bring in a unit over there to then threaten that objective. There's lots of things this, this model can do and it's all about being a good general and picking out where you need to apply the mortars. Again, the combination with Lord of Virulence and uh, Boil Blight, etc. just makes it even better. So this is a fantastic unit. Um, so what's good about them is obviously the Mortarian Lord of Virulence core package. So this gives them the ability to ignore the modifier to hit on the, the indirect so you're still hitting on freeze even if you can't see the target it a lot of runs can also spot a target now you're hitting on twos and ignoring cover which is fantastic you also can combine them with boil blight from stuff like cultist plays like we said before they were moving advancing early or even a hell brute because because a unit counts as being within contagion range of a hell brute that means they're also eligible to be hit by the boil blight stratagem so if the hell brute tags them you know you've got a unit that's potentially minus one save your plus one to hit and ignores cover on your mortar so you're hitting on twos out of line of sight because mortar is there with you as well ignoring cover at effectively ap2 it, it it really adds up um and the damage these guys can deal can be horrific especially if you get some hot rolls on these shot amounts um I like them with Plague Spitters because it makes them self-sufficient. They can protect themselves from units that want to come and just deal with stuff or tag them in combat, etc. Um, you know, five Seraphim squad drops down. You can just flame off an Overwatch if they want to try and charge you to get into an objective. Again, it's that self-defense, that board control, it's that movement denial, locking down areas, stopping people moving as freely and getting to where they want to be to score secondaries. Um, it's just a great bully unit. You can charge into a unit, you know, drive into them, smack them with a tank shock even if you want to. It's not the greatest, it's only strength 6, but you know, it's something. But then you stay in combat, in your turn you can flame yourself out of combat, fire the mortar elsewhere across the board, machine gun into the combat. It's, it's just so many applications for the Plague Spitters. And anti infantry 2 plus again is broken. I'm sorry, it is. Entropy cannons I feel a bit more niche on. I don't I always bring a pair because I like having the extra back anti-tank, but it only being strength 10 kind of limits its usefulness. Now it does have lethal hits, which can make up for it a bit, but again it depends how good you are at rolling sixes. Um, however, having a pair of entropy cannons does allow it to perform a bit more of a longer range function. Not as good as if it was 36, but the ability to sit further back than the flamer ones and still impact the game is quite nice. However, I do believe this job is potentially done better by a unit we're about to cover soon. So, Defiler. Ugh. Defiler's a hard one for me to talk about because I don't actually own a Defiler. But, going off what I've been told from Bob LaPonge, Don Houston, etc., from people that have used Defilers, that offensively, they're cracking. And they do battle cannon. They have tons of guns. You've got Battle Cannon, you've got your side guns, you, then your melee's like something like Stream 16 or something daft. Extra attacks of a Defiler Scourge. Insane tank shock on them because against 18 dice on any target. It's really nasty to deal with. Um, so offensively, I've heard basically they're just really solid. The amount of guns, the amount of melee that they can damage, damage the deal. It's D6 plus 1 melee damage as well. So that's really strong. Flat free damage, Battle Cannon. Obviously, you can take last cannons, heavy bottles, etc. Um, very very much potential to do a lot of damage mobility wise they do have a rule that lets them ignore terrain uh, as long as it's four inches lower now this is where this unit becomes make or break this unit can either be very mobile if you're on a on board that has a lot of four inch or terrain or less or more open spaces or it can not move at all if you play on uktc like me because they've ruled no terrain is less than four so this Model is unfortunately kind of unplayable on UKTC terrain, hence why I don't use it, which sucks because it's very cool. But if you are able to move this unit around and obviously get over four inches ruins, it massively increases the capacity. Because again, the big problem with units like this is mobility and getting around the board. Being able to walk over these kind of ruins massively increases the viability of this unit. Um, it's also a very good pressure unit. People shit the pants when they're defiler. Sorry poo the pants <laughs> when a defiler is running you down um so having two defilers or three defilers putting that pressure on an opponent especially you manage to somehow strategic reserve one which bob does which i think he's a madman because i have no idea he sneaks one of these in his opponent's back line but he does it 
um, being able to sneak these guys in and or even just again go to forward together especially if you back up with something like Morty it's a lot of pressure on the opponent because what do they shoot the defilers that are running them down the plague squads that are about to get into flame range or Mortar in the demon primark himself it's a lot of pressure to put on the opponent and a lot of if you make the wrong decision and these guys make combat they're going to really do a lot of damage to you so with defilers um I believe the sort of like the standard loadout is general purpose to file is with a heavy bolter or last cannon and the scourge. The scourge again just makes extra melee attacks, which is much more impactful than something like Havoc Launch you can put on. So everyone always takes the scourge. The heavy bolter or last cannon is completely up to you whether you want the anti tank or you just want some extra anti infantry firepower. Um, the minus one save contagion plus Lord of Virulence combo massively helps out the battle cannon because it's going to make the measly AP1 go to AP2 and ignore cover because it's a blast weapon and hit on twos, which makes a flat free damage weapon a lot better on this unit. Um, also makes the claws, I think, AP4? I think they're AP3 naturally. I'm not too sure. Have to double check that one. But again, it's just a very, very powerful unit. It's big. It's a big crab. It walks around, stabs stuff shoot stuff it's got everything sort of like you need it is fairly expensive do bear that in mind but i feel like you never just bring one defile i think if you bring some defiles i don't know there's a picture of rhino there i must have forgot to get rid of that my bad um nurgle defile pictures are quite hard to find actually <laughs> um nurgle's mansion discord who provides all these pictures this is the only one we say to struggle with <laughs> um, but yeah i believe the best pet used in pairs or trios as don Houston and bob always use them in multiples he's never just a single defiler so the Chaos Land Raider. The Land Raider is a fantastic unit that can struggle again with boards. Because the unit's so wide, on certain terrain like the UKTC again, it's very hard to move it around. However, if you are on a board that you're able to do, this thing can be very powerful. Offensively, it brings four last cannons, which is very nice because we lack long range anti tank. So having four God Hammer Pattern last cannons is very nice. Mobility wise, it moves 10 inches, I believe, which again, for us, is very quick. Defensively, toughness 12, 2 up save is hard to crack or on Mortarian levels. Um, again, most things in the game are maybe AP free for anti tank, but it should be very easy to get cover. So this thing effectively is always going to be taking at least 4 up, which is the same as Mortarian. It can pop smoke as well to get minus one to hit, which also gives it cover if you ever get caught in a pinch. Um, again, same benefit there, being able to save Cloud of Flies for a different unit. Um, the Assault Ramp rule really increases the mobility of our army. Being able to move, disembark, and then charge um, really helps certain units like Plague Marines and Terminators reach combat um, and gives us that extra reach that sometimes we don't normally have and can really enable those units to be massive damage dealers that they want to be rather than relying on stuff like rapid ingress or nine inch charges. Um, I believe it's quite good in a threat overload list again as well as I sort of said before, imagine this full of Plague Marines or Terminators accompanied by Mortarian two defilers running at you. It's a nightmare, what do you want to shoot? Because this thing is tougher than the other units but this thing is also carrying another unit inside it. Um, so it's like pick your poison, you either go for the easier to kill stuff and then get killed by the unit that's hiding inside this vehicle, or you try and shoot this thing, potentially fail, and then the defiles are running you down and you've still got to deal with this thing. Um, it's quite good if we're just putting pressure on an opponent. I don't own a land raider, I really want a land raider. I'm hopefully going to get one soon, because I really want to play around with it. But I think there's multiple uses for a land raider. So, I actually think land raiders work best with plague marines, because unfortunately, the capacity of our land raiders is 12. Which means you can't actually fit six death shards with a character in this, which really sucks, and I wish they'd change it to just let us do that. What you can do, however, is fit ten plague marines, a biology putrefier, and icon bearer in the squad. So this gives you the ability to basically drive this unit in a very tough um, vehicle. This absolute potential again. Why is the rhino picture that I'm so bad? I'm so sorry, people. Um, this unit that can potentially deal a lot of damage. Um, to an opponent, massive amount of spike, spike damage potential from a 10-man Plague Marine squad. Within the safety of a Land Raider, Biology Preach Fire is there to help this squad. It can, again, it can get out even throw a grenade strat, which is very nice. Um, again, makes the squad inside much more powerful. 
and the icon bearer being able to get out of this land raider after it's moved so it can move he can then hop out pop his banner or you can get out before it's moved move advance pop the banner just really again it gives him a lot of options to play around with it fulfills the role of the rhino but obviously a lot more powerful a lot more scary for getting into the opponent's lines <laughs> But I think this is actually probably the better use for it than bringing Terminators in it. Because you can put five Blight Lords in it plus a character. But I don't feel like five Blight Lords and a character is worth the investment of a Land Raider to deliver. The impact just isn't there. However, six Death Shard even without a character does have an impact on the board. And that is something that you can consider just transporting. Because six Death Shard even without character support is still six Death Shroud. So the, yeah, they won't have minus one to wound. However, they're still going to be doing a lot of damage in close combat. And being able to get a 4 inch move unit, move it 10, get out free, so that's 13 inches there, and then charge, is go really helps that unit reach close combat. Whereas relying on 9 inch deep strike charges isn't what I'd be recommending. If you're going to go for deep strike, rapid ingress those units, otherwise Land Raider can really help you out. Now another thing that you can also try is a character party bus. Uh, this was played by uh, uh, Don Hooson. Innis Wilson sort of does the character party bus as well, which is a previous episode, which is lots of characters with basically all very high damage in weaponry, like foul blight spawns, which have the potential to spike high. But also, they can all just be kicked out, and they can do actions, and it's a, it's a weird one. I wouldn't recommend this for people that are sort of new to the faction. This is definitely a very weird techie list choice if you want to do it. But... Having potentially three biological putrefies that can all pop out and all throw grenades is quite funny um, because you're potentially looking at you know, 18 dice every four, obviously nine average mortal wounds to a unit from three guys just popping out, followed by you know foul blight spawns with two ups anti infantry flamers at damage two. Um, against a lot of assassinate points, you'll be giving up, but you know, if you fancy doing a party bus, you've got a party bus. <laughs> So Predators are put together. Predators offer this army long-range firepower, which we don't normally have. They're quite cheap for the, for the cost, 130 points for the hull and for the range, and the firepower is actually very good. They vary between anti-elite and anti-vehicle, because we have the annihilator for anti-vehicle, the, anti, the destructor for anti-elite. So sort of tailor it to your preferences. Um, defensively, they're not the most impressive things in the world. Free up armor save, but toughness 10 is nice. Um, but... One thing I have noticed with Predators is because they're relatively unassuming and they're not really up in your face, again, because of the range that these guys have, they don't tend to get shot as much, which means one Predator at the back, which is why I use a Predator Annihilator with its LAS cannons, usually doesn't draw too much attention and usually gets to go the entire game just putting LAS cannon shots down range. And the one thing that's good about these vehicles is, again, the range, but it's also the potential to spike damage. Having last cannons that can do d6 plus 1 damage on a unit that can potentially reroll 1s for damage if you're an Annihilator. If they have a round of failing and vulnerables, the odds are you're going to deal quite a lot of damage to them. Because each shot is minimum 3, because again, you're going to reroll any 1s you get. Now of course you can reroll 1 into a 1, it happens, but odds are that you won't. So, being able to fire this unit... And potentially, like, I've had multiple times where I've got a 1 on the damage and I've re-rolled it into a 5 or a 6. And that spike of damage will sometimes just explode a vehicle entirely on its own because they failed a couple of invulnerables. And then this unit starts to get a bit more attention, but at that point he's, he's got one trade-off. And because it's so cheap with the hull, one trade-off this vehicle is usually enough to get value off it. Um, again, it's just one of those units that we don't have much access to which can hold a long firing angle down like a, like a big firing lane on the board and potentially deal a lot of consistent shots, um, whether that be anti-elite with their destructor or anti-vehicle with the annihilator. So obviously, these are sort of like your loadout. So destructor with last kinds is sort of like your all-purpose. So if you really can't decide what use you want for your predator, but you just want a main battle tank that can do a bit of everything, I'd recommend destructor with last kinds. Um, but if you're very set in what you want it to do, which is for me is the Annihilator, obviously go full last cannon and destructor if you really want anti-elite, put the heavy balls on it. This is a this is this unit again the Rhino. I'm so bad. I'm so sorry. <laughs> this unit is best used to plug holes in your list. For 130 points, my list for example lacks anti-tank, so putting an Annihilator in for 130 points helps plug that hole. Because again. He doesn't draw too much tension. He can engage cross-board with his range on his last cannons, which is really nice. 
and he just offers that unique long range aspect and that long range fire support in as I've said there an otherwise mid range close combat brawling army. Plus with the Mortarian Real Ones it really helps him to sort of stick the damage. So as long as you can hit the hit rolls, so you know, three rolls of three ups, which you average hit two, and then your main gun's twin linked on the Annihilator, but your side sponsors will be wounded on threes against most targets, and more times you're going to give them real ones. So there's a good chance you're going to land your wounds fairly reliably. And again, if they fail in vulnerables, your damage is semi-reliable as well, because you're basically looking at minimum three, because if you roll a one, you can re-roll it. And there's plenty of times it'll happen where you roll a six and a one, you re-roll the one into another six, and then again, there's the spike. You've just suddenly done 14 damage, and bang, the unit's gone. It can just happen, and it's so good when it happens. So Predators, I, I don't, I think two is probably at max to cap out. There probably is a list that could use three, but I think having one Predator in your list for your sim, like you lack anti-vehicle, a single Annihilator, I've never regretted bringing him. It's a little predator that could. Fantastic unit. Chaos Spawn. So Spawn are an interesting one. They kind of do this role of either early trade pieces because they move 8 inches, which is quite nice. They can also hold backfield because, as we said before, at Poxwalk, it's having feel no pain. This unit has feel no pain. It's also higher toughness and it also has a better save as a 4 up save. So these guys can actually be deceptively tough. Another thing these guys have going for them is they can actually punch back potentially. So if like five Seraphim or something come in, shoot your flamers, don't kill you because again, you're much tougher than a Poxwalker. Then they charge in to take the point. You can then actually, they can't they can't charge you and know they're safe. Whereas you could be like 10 Poxwalkers. This unit has AP, it has damage two attacks, and it has a random amount of like D6 plus two attacks or something like that. So this unit, if it spikes hot on its rolls, can actually do a lot of damage to marine equivalents, etc. So it's not something you can engage freely without using your brain. Um, again, don't get me wrong, it, chances are it won't do that, but the fact it can is a nice threat to have. I think this makes it very good as backfield objective holds or side objective holders. Um, again, they can't be picked up for free by absolutely anything that cultists can be. But they're also pretty good for early trade pieces. Not as efficient as cultists, because again, these are 70 points compared to... 50 however they are tough for two kill you can't just pick them with bolt rifles for example or something like that or normal flamers these guys require a little bit more investment which sometimes can make them much more worth it um so yeah movement eight is great for first to advance to middle objectives they can also potentially get within range of stuff from deployment to be able to action on it again the rhinos back again i'm so sorry i'm so crap <laughs> feel pain on units can be very spiky but if you manage to spike it in the right way, it can be very powerful. Um, again, feel no pain is better than like a five up save, but these guys have a four up save and a feel no pain, which makes them very good. They also heal to full, I believe. Um, I'll have to double check that. Um, I believe they still have the healing rule. Um, so chip damage isn't going to help opponents against them. It's just a unit that can be used in the same role that Poxwalkers and Cultists can be, but is much harder to kill can heal hopefully that's still a rule i think it is uh, and also potentially spike hard on saves and deal they have the opponent deal nothing and the thing is if the opponent like really whiff the shots against cultists of pox walkers they can still charge that unit and chances are they'll be fine whereas that's not something you can do against chaos spawn because again if you're actually a bad unit in melee and you charge spawn it can actually end up being really bad for you um so I believe these guys do have a purpose. I'm not personally running anything for any of them, but I just wish they were a little cheaper. 70 points is quite expensive. 60 points I think would be great. Um, and I wish you could also take them in units of one again. However, again, if I've, if what I've just said there is sounds relevant to you, if you're having a unit that's killed a bit too easily by a lot of like small deep striking units, or they're just getting charged and killed, maybe consider looking at two spawn instead, because it might be what you need to shore up that weakness in your list. And of course, the Miasma Malignifier, the best unit, the absolute, it's too meta, I don't run it, it's so meta, it's so powerful, it's just, it's it's everything, it's beautiful, it's majestic, it does everything, it's move over Mortarian, Mortarian is not a centerpiece model, this is the true centerpiece model, offensively it's perfect, defensively it's perfect, the cost doesn't matter because it's perfect, mobility, it can be anywhere it wants, you can deploy it wherever, that is the pure mobility, the impact on the game, it does everything. Your opponent looks at you and goes, is that a malignifier? Is making the and you're like, damn right. And he goes, my goodness, you actually brought that thing. And he just shakes your hand and concedes on the spot. 
beautiful. Personal rating, 10 out of 10, unbeatable, best unit in the game. Um, but really, obviously, this thing's a terrain piece, um, so it's not really going to be used many times in your competitive games. It is mainly used for narrative events and stuff like that, or I have, I don't, I've never heard someone manage to make this thing work. If you manage to make it work, I'll be very impressed with you. But for most people, it's just a cool model that can be used on tables, and I don't think it will make it into many com or any competitive lists. But that's fortifications for you, just kind of the way they work. But it's a fantastic model. If you want someone to paint, it's very cool. And if you're making a table, it's a fantastic piece of scenery. But I wouldn't look at this thing and using it on the table as an actual effective model. Um that's all the units we made it my goodness so to summarize we have a diverse list of options the contagion impact has made our roster so much more viable in so many ways it's just made the game and our list building feel a lot more open think about your list identity skew lists as we said before you might want more demon engines a lot of toughness high um, if you want to put pressure skew list, you can go stuff like Defilers. We'll look at Carnivore, stuff like that. A guy went recently, he won, the, he won it, well, he didn't win, he went 4-1 with three Flesh Mode Drones, three Carnivores, Mortarion, all running the opponent down. There's lots of things that we can do and play around with, which, again, we'll talk about in the Allies section when we get to the next video. However, there's lots of different identities of list now, which are fantastic, and our units all now get in these Contagions. And just being made so much more effective has made list building much more fun, much more enjoyable. And I genuinely feel like we have no terrible units. Like, every unit has a place. There is better units than others. Well, there's one terrible unit. We won't talk about that. Um, <laughs> but every unit, part of the one, has a place and can be used successfully. And I believe that you can make it work. Um, so if you have a favorite unit and it's not the it's not the most meta thing, I still think you can make it work. Even if it's just a one-off, fun-off um, last edition, I always ran the heavy light launch drone because it wasn't the greatest, but I just thought it was a sick model, and I managed to go five and O's and four and ones with that unit. You can always run your fun unit, and I don't think there's anything anywhere near as bad as the old Codex Barnes. I think it's all very usable and very cool. And, and remember, everyone, a win for Death Guard is a win for Kirby. But that brings us to the end of this. So thank you everyone for sticking with it. I know it's a long video. These videos are long. But again, I just really want to talk about every unit. Give every unit a chance to shine. Thank you to the Nurgle's Discord. Uh, Mansion Discord once again. Um, and thank you to the members all on the screen here now. All these lovely members. These are people that are actually paying me for some reason. Because they think what I'm saying is worth anything. Um, these people are probably insane. Um, to, to actually do that and support me but I massively appreciate these people on screen right now um, I never thought I'd get to a point where I'd have having members but the fact that I had these guys members within like the first video first live stream of being made a member is so massively like such a morale boost and such a like a it just made me feel so happy um, and I can't describe it. I'm like overwhelmed by the support. So if you would like to become a member as well and join the Nurgle's, uh, sorry, Discussing the Resilient Podcast as a member, there is a join button below on the video. Um, I think it's three pound or three dollars, I think it is a month. Um, so feel free to join. You will get to vote on upcoming content. We're also going to talk about, obviously, get some emotes and stuff you can put in chat and live chats. Um, you also have early access to certain videos and you can sort of help shape the future of the of the podcast and obviously we can just hang out and chill um etc we'll, we'll we'll think there's plenty to come there's plenty to come and i hope you're all as excited as i am 10th really only just like starting um we're getting the second codex out very soon with space marines obviously ours is a while away but i will be here for throughout thick and thin to join you guys we'll keep this series going we'll make new series we'll look at lists we'll look at people's lists that have done well we've got lgt coming up I will say you probably won't hear from me now until after LGT, um, but again, that'll be a great stream, hopefully, when we come back, and I'm just hyped. The game's in a great state. The channel's growing. I'm super happy. Hopefully, you guys are learning new things with this channel. Stick with us, uh, and we'll... Yeah, the future's, the future's green. The future's bright. The future is full of plague and pestilence, but for now, thank you very much for watching. I hope you found this useful, and I will catch you on the next video. Thank you very much for tuning in. And I'll see you later, guys. Bye-bye.